Welcome to this next session in business strategy and growth, where we'll be looking at how rural vacation rentals overtook urban rentals in 2020. We'll be joined by Erinch Arik and Tom Caton. A huge thank you to our title sponsor, Verbo. And just a quick reminder to make sure that you're putting questions into the Q&A box because Erinch and Tom will be answering those. Um, Tom, Erinch. Welcome all. Uh, I'm Erin from Your Port Rep. Uh, today we have Thomas here from AirDNA, probably, probably you know about the, the company. And today we will talk about the rural and urban rentals and how they are doing after pandemic. So um, uh, welcome Thomas, can you uh, introduce uh, yourself? Sure Eric, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm Tom well, Kniff, co founder at AirDNA. Um, started in 2015, been picking up data globally on short-term rentals. So Hopefully, I've got the skills and experience to bring into this uh, discussion as about how rural and urban vacation rentals have changed. Thanks, Eric. I, I'm sure you do. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let's dive in. You know, our life has changed. Travel has changed in the world. So, and we are having extraordinary times. So, uh, you are sitting on a like a very big data about our um, vacation rental market. And during this process, how did you observe that the urban versus rural rentals have been doing in the United States comparing to Europe? So did you, did you notice any significant differences like in, in terms of bounce back rates, uh, reservation um, details, like the length of stay rates, et cetera? Sure. Uh, Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so when we were monitoring the situation unfold, <clears throat> we were doing it with a self-interest at first because uh, as China started to fall low, which is a, I'm not sure if we sell anything in China at the moment. So it's a, a minuscule market in terms of our business, but we were looking at it to see what happened to accommodation, um, worrying it would come over here. And then as it came to Europe, we were looking through our data more, is this going to be a problem for our business as much as the data it would mean in terms of short-term rental data? And it was clearly sequential that Asia fell first, then Europe fell, and then the US fell finally. And then as uh, then Asia began to pick up a little more uh, as the US hit the nadir of its experience. But, you know, things have been thoroughly depressed ever since. As we know, um, that vacation rentals have done slightly better than hotels, but uh, it's still poor for everyone. Um, when we see these differences between the Europe and the US, they're not grave, the differences. Urban uh, environments are 70% down on occupancy. So these places like Paris, Berlin, um, New York, LA, because nobody wants a city break at the moment. Business travel is grounded to a halt. And then, um, yeah, we really started seeing it in early March, the falls, and then it continued to fall through April and May. And then June, I mean, do you remember the golden days of June when it looked as though coronavirus was falling away, people were booking their summer holidays, it was risk on again, and we saw a real spike there. And some of those months in late May and early June saw the most number of bookings ever on the platforms for that particular week. So what I mean is, I think maybe it was the first week of June was the peak. More bookings happened for the rest of the summer in the first week of June than happened at any other week because people suddenly, oh, we can book a summer holiday. But uh, that has uh, drifted away a bit now. Summer's over. COVID's rising. We're seeing numbers fall off again beyond what we'd expect seasonally. Yeah, then yeah, that that makes sense. I also uh, read a, um, a report that you guys published. Uh, about short-term rental and the uh, like the recent development. So I remember you were saying that like the uh, vacation rentals actually are performing better than hotels. So um, what do you see as a reason behind this uh, like the difference? Uh, what would you say? Yeah, I mean it's clear by far if you're looking for a comfortable vacation, uh, a vacation rental is the place to do it, not a hotel. I actually had spent a couple of weeks in Ibiza this summer, and one week was in a hotel where you, you know, it was like living in a plastic bag. You know, you had to put your mask on everywhere. Half the facilities were closed. The restaurant was unpleasant. 
Of course, all the waiters were wearing masks. It was just a really substandard experience. And then the following week, I was in a vacation rental. And as soon as you entered the threshold of your vacation rental, coronavirus was forgotten. You know, it was just the people you were with. You could enjoy yourself with your mask off. There was a pool. And I think people around the world have seen this. In particular, we've seen the real premiums come in for amenities. So when you think in remote destinations, people really value having things like, you know, a swimming pool or a tennis court or anything that's extra and outside that is beyond a normal vacation rental. You see really large premiums for them. But by far, vacation rentals in rural areas have easily outcompeted at hotels. And that's happened uh, throughout the world because it's just such a more comfortable experience. And vacation rental, ADR, as in the SDR report we showed, uh, it's got a higher ADR than ever uh, for rural areas. Oh, in fact, overall, it has a higher ADR than ever, just because the larger properties tend to have higher ADRs and that are well, particularly tempting with people looking to escape the pandemic, whether it be for a couple of weeks or several months. Yeah, that's that's uh, I believe like uh, I have my own rental as well. Uh, it is uh, like not in the city center and I definitely uh, see that peak. And I, I, I think I also experienced this the first week of June, uh, getting a couple of reservations for the rest of the year. So, yeah. And uh, let's uh, come back to the city centers and the like the urban area hosts. So um, how do you think that? like um, like a host or a big operator in an urban uh, city, uh, like you said, um, what should they do? What should they consider for the next? Can data yours or something else can help them make new decisions uh, to like um, keep the business up? Sure. And that's the tough decision every urban operator has is shall I keep the business up? Because that's good inventory and you can put that on the long term market. You could sell the house if you own it. You have other options for that inventory. So what should you do? Um, so, of course, as a data seller, I would say buy data <laughs> to help you understand the decision. But the reasons to look at data to help you understand this decision is, if you've been unlucky or is, you know, if you, with our tools, you can see how many bookings are happening, what the future bookings are, uh, and it will help you give you all the information to make that quite important decision about your business. In general, in general, if you're a large operator in one of these big cities, it doesn't make sense to keep all of your inventory on the short-term rental market. I think what we've seen a lot of operators do is look for the medium-term market. And though you can list those through Airbnb and the traditional uh, travel platforms, it's worth looking wider to other platforms where you can distribute that inventory and get them on where if we look at where, when can you hope to have some resurgence? Maybe next summer, if you're optimistic. So you're looking to fill with like six, nine month leases uh, where you'll be able to get your short-term rental inventory back. Uh, and that's the problem if you put in the long-term market that many, uh, many of the laws around uh, most particularly European cities mean you can't then remove the tenants when you want to put it back on the short-term rental industry. But this business is going to come back. It might be one year, it might be 18 months, but it's going to be a super strong business. And I think when people feel comfortable to travel again to cities, it's travel is going to be bigger than ever. There's going to be the pent up demand, the yearning to see the, the sites of these big cities again. So your business, you've just got to stay alive. Uh, so looking at things like what is the ADR for different events? Is it worth keeping them open for New Year? And you can see that already in the forward trends data providers like us provide. But you have to make that rational decision that if you had 200 units in London, Amsterdam, Barcelona, it's going to be a real struggle for the next nine months. So, And I think the data will tell you how big the struggle is and where, whether it's worth making a transition out temporarily, even temporarily out of the short term rental business. Yeah, that's yeah, it is. I, you say it is a matter of surviving to see the good days again. So where the short-term rental business uh, rocks, uh, like uh, before. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned that the uh, people uh, or the managers uh, consider the medium, uh, mid-term rentals, et cetera. Um, and uh, regarding the o um, OTAs, like Airbnb, VRV, or Booking, 
Um, I'm also actively hosting, as I said, and I see that, that they are releasing new features like cleaning protocols, long stay discounts, all kinds of stuff. Uh, looking from the inventory side and all these new features and the action taken, how, how do you uh, elevate the uh, position of the OTA? Yeah. Uh, so the OTAs, I mean, obviously had such a difficult time. Airbnb, it's been well documented how their business really fell apart. We're still looking to IPO in December. Booking.com never realised how lucky it was to get into vacation rentals a couple of years earlier. Glenn Fogel's talked about it's been their shining light. And we can see the behaviour of how they've had to adapt. So looking at our data, prior to March the 10th, the average length of stay was 3.8 days. From, from the March 10th to May the 1st, it went up to six days. And it's remained stronger at four and a half days. So length of stay has changed in the way that is. So people are looking to stay for longer periods of time. Now, some of those are obviously the longer term guests. And the OTAs, I think, have tried to make that a thing, that stay month to month, stay for three months. I think they've really done it on the front end way so far and not really done it in the core of their business, being able to offer it for three months. It's You know, you go to Airbnb long term, there's a different front end, but the policies are the same. Uh, they're working on lowering their fee structure for longer term stays. Um, but it is it's difficult. It's, it's almost like a very different business to uh, get into for them. So uh, the OTAs, uh, they've had a hard time, of course. And I think the cleaning protocols, it's, um, I don't think they can enforce that well. You know, it's a bit of a mirage that you say, you, uh, you know, you tick the checkbox to say, I will follow the five, well, it's not five, is it the 50 step protocol <laughs> to clean? between each thing, but I mean, is that really going to change host behavior considerably? I don't know, but I think they have the great advantage. And this was a debate that we had kind of earlier in the crisis. Are people going to prefer the guaranteed cleanliness standards of a Marriott hotel or, but the risk of interacting with other people on a subpar experience or roll a dice and get that country home and think, well, it might not have been bleached within an inch of its life, but once we're in, we're in. So, I think those cleaning standards, um, you know, I think that's kind of a, a display, really. So it's very difficult for the OTAs to enforce them. So they have to give lip service, say, oh, we're just cleaning as hotels. We have these protocols. But uh, I think, obviously, the hotel room will always be cleaner than a vacation rental in general. So, I mean, it's good that they institute those protocols to make guests feel happier. But um, I don't think it's uh, going to be a huge impact on their business. Yeah, that, that's also a big question. Uh, at the first days of the pandemic, my friends were talking about taking a vacation and comparing hotels versus Airbnbs. It was it was the question, hey, these hotels are professional, but on the other hand, I will have the entire home for myself. So it is a tough decision made for travelers. So you mentioned that the rural areas bounce back better after pandemic, where people avoid etc. But uh, if you look at this uh, behavior in, in from the eyes of investors, do you think this travel trends has changed forever? I mean, uh, what what do you expect in the like uh, next two, three years or five years span? Yeah, I think um, there's going to be temporary change. And people talk about the great Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, and how it was remarkable that in a uh, 1920 it was forgotten about and how things quickly restored but we we live in a slightly different world with the benefit of telecommuting now so i think there is going to be um we you know i, I don't i'm not an expert in this but you know more companies having more remote work is going to be a feature and then i think uh, aside from that even forgetting about that i think people with money who may have been able to afford a second home before are now making that more of a strategic priority for them. So what does this mean? Uh, so it means, and as we've seen in the UK, house prices are booming in rural areas as people look to secure these second homes uh, whilst keeping, for now, their residents ordinarily in London or in the big cities. Uh, so there's been really high demand for the purchase price of second homes. But I think for the short-term rental investor, I think 
when we look back in three or four years, that demand for short-term rentals in the rural areas will not sustain. I think there will be, when we have a vaccine, there will be, uh, it will recall to where it once was. Now, if you're looking to buy second homes, forget about short-term rentals, I think there will be a sustained view. Now we've got a second home, you appreciate it, you enjoy it, you've cut your finances to be able to afford that. And I think we can say for people who are using those second homes, there might be even an excess of supply uh, and the prices might be a little depressed in these areas because so many people will have purchased their second homes and not be living in them most of the time as the world is restored. In the short term, of course, short term rentals are going to do very, continue to do very well in the rural areas. And really your bet is how long until there's a sufficient vaccine that people feel comfortable resuming life as they did or um is this going to be something that's going to last five seven eight years oh the thought of it <laughs> makes me want to cry but um but then that short-term rent those investment in the uh, rural areas will be particularly strong if i had a long time horizon say in my city of barcelona uh there are short-term rentals that uh there are no more tourist licenses to give out but if you buy a property with a tourist license you know you you'll keep that one you know, if I had the uh, if I had the cash and the long term view, I think in terms of investing, there's a lot of urban short term rentals that uh, could be get for great value, and in two years that will return. So, you know, that's uh, my view on um, as a short term rental investor over the medium term is that the rural ones are not going to sustain so much, and sure, and your urban apartments are going to come back booming, maybe in 2023, you know, <laughs> if you can wait. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I mean, I also believe that with the vaccine and everything, so the life will go back to the normal. Uh, I believe, I hope earlier than we predict, uh, but I definitely looking forward to it in terms of business and in terms of traveling as well. So uh, like we in the Europe. Right? Hopefully we can do yeah. this next year, right? Exactly, exactly. So, um, and besides these uh, questions, Thomas, um, do you have like or your company? Um, what is the like the um, most maybe not let's say most popular or most obvious prediction you or your company have uh, for the uh, for the next next few uh, months or years? Um, yeah, I think uh, what we're seeing really in the sector is I think um, much more of a fusion of property managers and real estate. When we look at our customer base, it's significantly more on the real estate investor side than it used to be. Uh, so I don't, I, it's always seemed vacation rentals is a travel business. But I think as people, more institutional money has got more comfortable with that Airbnb and the like, it's here to stay, it's a thing, the regulatory hurdles, it's kind of clearer where that's going to finish up. Uh, and particularly with the Airbnb IPO, at the end of the year, I think a lot of people in the business need to uh, understand the real estate dynamics far more than they probably do already. And we as a company, I need a, me or my co-founder has even bought a house. And, you know, with this onslaught of interest from the real estate investor side, have quickly had to educate ourselves about the opportunities and having short-term rentals flow through the ecosystem more. So, why on right move they not uh, address whether that should be the income that that place might generate as a short term rental or on Zoopla or the, you know the British portals or on Zillow because I think that's a real fusion of uh, what is the value of your property is becoming more institutional so everyone uh, attending host should make sure they're keeping up with uh, real estate news just as much as travel news I think that's going to be the big change we're going to see in the next year or two. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, good, good view. I like it. So, uh, yeah, Thomas, once again, uh, thank you for the great insights. Uh, I believe uh, it will be also very uh, helpful uh, for investors, for operators, for even for individual hosts, um, hosting people uh, on different platforms and um, curious about what's going to happen uh, in the future and how we can prepare all ourselves. So, um, one, as I said, once again, uh, thank you very much for the information and for your us. Thanks very much, Aaron. Cheers. Bye-bye.
Thanks so much, guys. That was great. Coming up next are the first lot of roundtables. So do check everything out and see what you can get involved with. It's a really great way for you to get properly involved with content and, and get stuck in with all of our sponsors and exhibitors. Thank you.